Hola, buenas tardes, eh, bienvenidas y bienvenidos de vuelta a esta sesión que forma parte del coloquio eh, titulado Trayectorias y Redes de Solidaridad Internacional desde las Izquierdas, México Siglo XX, organizado por eh, el, colegio, el Colegio Mexiquense, eh, el Instituto de Investigaciones Históricas de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, el Instituto Nacional de Estudios sobre las Revoluciones de México. El día de hoy, en esta sesión, tenemos la presentación del último libro de la profesora Kelly Drew Hernández. Ella es profesora de Historia y Estudios Afroamericanos y Planeación Urbana en la Universidad de California, Los Ángeles. Entre sus publicaciones eh, están, podemos mencionar, los libros galardonados Migra, A History of the U.S. Border Patrol, del 2010, y también el libro City of Inmates, Conquest, Rebellion, and the Rise of Human Cajun in Los Ángeles, del 2017. Y el libro que nos reúne hoy aquí, eh, que está por salir, eh, es, se titula Bad Mexicans, Race, Empire and Revolution in the Borderlands. Entonces, la dinámica de la sesión va a ser eh, de la siguiente manera. La profesora Kelly nos dará unas, eh, una presentación de, de, de qué se trata este, este último, último libro. Eh, después, eh, Israel nos dará una una respuesta a esta presentación y los invitamos a que manden sus comentarios, preguntas a las redes sociales donde se está transmitiendo este evento, que son las redes sociales del Colegio Mexiquense en YouTube y Facebook. Entonces, sin más preámbulo, eh, le doy la palabra y agradezco la presencia presentación de la doctora Kelly Lidl Hernández. Ok, gracias Abraham por la introducción y la invitación para platicarles de mi nuevo libro que he titulado Bad Mexicans, Race, Empire and Revolution in the Borderlands. Y antes de empezar, yo quiero decir que estoy en una ciudad hoy conocida como Los Ángeles, pero reconozco como mi presencia en el territorio tradicional, ancestral y no cedido de los pueblos Gabrielino y Tomba. Y también yo reconozco que ustedes ya conocen bien la historia de PLM. Um, ustedes son historiadores de la izquierda en México y no voy a enseñarles nada hoy. Um, más que nada, hoy yo necesito su ayuda <ríe> porque este libro con ese libro estoy tratando de llevar la historia del PLM a más gente de los Estados Unidos, a gente que no conoce bien la historia de México ni de la historia de los mexicanos americanos. Entonces, para mí, este libro es parte de un proyecto de abrir la historia popular de los Estados Unidos y en los Estados Unidos a temas, eventos, personajes mexicanos y mexicano americano. Y hablar con franqueza, estoy usando la historia dramática, cinemática, épica del PLM para contrabandear la historia mexicana y americana en el corazón del U.S. History. Entonces voy a dar una presentación como la haría en los Estados Unidos y ustedes pueden darme sus opiniones sobre cómo puedo mejorarla. Uh, y finalmente, ustedes ya saben que español no es mi lengua materna. Yo voy a hablar en Spanglish, en inglés, una mezcla entre los dos. Entonces, empezamos. Yo puedo compartir el... Ok, ¿pueden ver bien? Ya lo vemos, sí. Ok. Ok, entonces, Malos Mexicanos o Bad Mexicans cuenta la historia de un grupo de disidentes mexicanos quienes fueron México a principios del siglo XX para provocar una revolución contra el dictador en México. Ustedes ya saben, el dictador es Porfirio Díaz. 
Los disidentes llamados los magonistas, o como Díaz los denigró, los malos mexicanos, cruzaron la frontera a Laredo, Texas, en enero de 1904. Y después de unos días notaron que los perseguían los to por todos lados. Sabían que los hombres que eran los espías de Díaz y los magonistas huyeron a San Antonio y luego a San Luis, donde regresaron su periódico Renación, creado por el partido político el PLM, el PLM y hasta organizaron un ejército. En mil, 1906, el ejército de PLM atacó la pequeña ciudad de Jiménez, México. Este ataque provocó miedo por todos los Estados Unidos. Porque a principios del siglo XX, inversores americanos tenían inversiones importantes en el México de días. Ciudadanos y ciudadanos estadounidenses eran propietarios de un cuarto de la tierra de mexicana, mexicana y dominaban industrias mexicanas claves como el ferrocarril y la minería. Y esos inversores contaban con 10 para proteger sus inversiones. This part's really important. U.S. investors were fully committed to the Diaz regime and believed that they could, that he could protect their money in Mexico. El ataque de Jiménez sugirió que Díaz no podía protegerlos. Entonces, el gobierno de los Estados Unidos trabajó muy cercanamente con el régimen de Díaz y con un grupo de espías para crear un equipo counterinsurgency, a great cross-border counterinsurgency um, group para aplastar los magonistas antes de empezar una revolución que los Estados Unidos no podía controlar. En entonces, entre 1906 y 1910, los departamentos en los Estados Unidos de guerra, justicia, estado, labor, comercio y jefes de policía, agentes de inmigración y más, trabajaron juntos con Díaz para extraditar, deportar o encarcelar cientos de los uh, magonistas por toda la frontera. But it didn't work. Magonistas persisted. They um, were faster, they were smarter, and they were quicker than the cross-border counterinsurgency campaign. By middle, by, I'm sorry, I'm gonna speak in English now. By 1910, um, the Magonistas had organized four armed attacks against Mexico from Texas. And they had really incited the outbreak of the revolution. So this book, Bad Mexicans, Malos Mexicanos, tells the story of the Magonistas and the cross-border counterinsurgency campaign that failed to stop them from inciting a revolution. Now, why is this story important to tell, in particular from the perspective um, and within the context of the United States? Well, it's a dramatic story. Um, it's a cinematic story as we talked about before but hardly anyone in the United States knows anything about the Magonistas or about the Mexican Revolution. And so what I'm trying to do with this book is use the epic tale of the PLM to smuggle major themes and stories and characters from Mexican American and Mexican history into the heart of the American story. Um, I personally first learned about the Magonistas when I was in graduate school about 20 years ago. And I was struck by the dynamism of the story and I was hooked on their story. Um, I would spend many years reading about them, all the books that have been published, you all know the historiography as well as I do, um, that have been published in Mexico, in the United States and beyond have taken on many aspects of the Magonista movement, the, um, the women, the, the politics, the debates between socialism and anarchism. Um, all of this has already been written about and I read it all 
And the more that I read, the more shocked, the more dismayed I became that people in the United States did not know the Magonista story. And most often what happens with the PLM in the United States is it gets tucked into a corner of Mexican American history, which itself is really seen as a tangent to the mainstream US history. But I was pretty sure, um, even from those early readings, that the Magonista story like, strikes at the heart of the American story. And we just needed to uncover that. So over the years, I wrestled with it. And I, I think I figured out some of the major ways that the PLM story occupies the heart of US history. So first and foremost, is this begins with this image in the story of Manifest Destiny. As we know, the Magonistas rebelled against a dictator in Mexico, but that dictator's reign grew under the wing of US empire. And US empire took its first steps in Diaz's Mexico. So the United States government um, really spent the 19th century charging across the North American continent in search of new lands for its white citizens to occupy. They were ginned up, right? They were full in the chest of this racial theory of manifest destiny, that they, the arriving Anglo-Americans, um, the so-called settlers backed by troops, had a claim to indigenous lands um, and life throughout the American West. And by the mid 19th century, the US settler state, also the so-called white man's republic, began to seriously consider a new kind of expansion that's economic and political domination without territorial acquisition. And they began this form of expansion in Mexico under the rule of Orfeo Diaz, a legendary military general who seized power by Cudeta in 1876 and refused to let go until forced from power in 1911. Now, as we know, throughout his reign, Porfirio Diaz invited foreign investors to buy land, extract resources, and use labor without directly assuming control over territory or governance. And by 1900, US citizens, um, including everyone from like these one pick miners to the Rockefellers, right? The major robber barons of the, of the era, they owned about 130 million acres of Mexican land, amounting about a quarter of the Mexican ar arable land base. And of all the money that American citizens, US citizens invested abroad, about 50% of it was in Diaz's Mexico. So people like William Randolph Hearst, a very powerful publisher and industrialist in the United States said things like, I really don't see what is prevent us from owning all of Mexico and running it to suit ourselves. And with Diaz in charge, um, that's, they got pretty close to doing that. It's also important to understand this story because the Magonistas help us to see the origin story of mass labor migration between Mexico and the United States. Um, it's this rising US empire, what some people call the integration of the US and Mexican economies that displaced millions of Mexicans and ignited mass migration from Mexico. The violence of the coming revolution only accelerated that flow so that by the 1920s, Mexican migrants would become the primary low wage with labor force across the American West. By 1980, Mexicans had become the largest immigrant group arriving in the United States, ending Europe's long dominance in the US immigration story. By 2010, more immigrants had arrived from Mexico than any other country in US history. And this speaks to Ariel's talk yesterday about, yesterday about the depopulation of Mexico. Um, the other side of that is the population of the United States. So today, Latinos led by Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants constitute the largest non-white population in the United States. And by 2045, the United States is projected to be a minority majority nation with Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants at the lead. So in other words, um, the rise of US empire and the outbreak for the 1910 Mexican revolution are seminal events in US history. They transformed who we are as a people. But it's important to note that Mexico's labor migrants were not America's immigrants and their arrival in mass at the beginning of the 20th century opened a new field of race and iniquity in the United States. 
Since the US-Mexico War, Anglo-Americans have largely regarded Mexican immigrants and Mexican-Americans, people of Mexican descent, as a so-called conquered mixed race people slotted by manifest destiny to serve settler citizens and fuel their industries or to disappear. Migrating from job to job across the American West, Mexican labor migrants built the region's industries while running headfirst into a web of white supremacy. They confronted low wages, dangerous working conditions, segregation, racial violence, and a racially biased immigration regime amounting to what many scholars describe as, quote, Juan Crow, a derivative of Jim Crow that African-Americans were facing, especially in the American South, but across the country. So in fact, this book about a revolution in Mexico begins with a lynching in Texas. And I wanna read a little bit from the book. This is the opening of the book um, from an introduction entitled, We Stand Between. They lit the pyre and watched him burn. Antonio Rodriguez, a 20 year old ranch hand murdered a white woman, they said. White men from nearby farms formed a posse to track him down, while other residents of Rock Springs, Texas, some 400 of them, met at the edge of town and piled kindling at the base of Mesquite Tree. The posse soon arrived with a cowboy in the lead, dragging Rodriguez by a lasso looped around his neck. The mob laughed as they chained Antonio to the tree and they doused him in kerosene. Someone threw a match and 20, 30 minutes later, when Antonio Rodriguez was dead, the residents of Rock Springs returned quietly to town and business was resumed. It was November 3rd, 1910. Mexican-American journalists in the US-Mexico borderlands reported the grisly details of Rodriguez's murder, condemning it as an act of racial terror akin to the lynching of African-Americans in the South. Newspapers in Mexico picked up the story. Quote, lynching is not practiced by the blonde Yankee except upon beings who for ethnic reasons he considers his inferiors, fumed the editors of Mexico, the Mexico City newspaper, El Debate. Another paper dubbed Anglo-Americans the quote, barbarous whites of the North, deriding them as the giants of the dollar, but pygmies of culture. There is indignation among Mexicans here over this lynching, reported El País. By November 8th, riots had erupted across Mexico, targeting the considerable number of US-owned businesses and homes. The protesters smashed windows and tore down American flags while chanting, mueren los, y los Yankees, death to the Americans. The police arrest arrested hundreds of people. In one case, officers drew sabers and descended upon a crowd, killing one man by stabbing him through the neck. The protests continued on the streets and in the press, prompting Henry Lane Wilson, US ambassador to Mexico, to issue a public warning. The United States government will quote, leave nothing undone to protect US citizens and protect US property in Mexico. It was a threat. The United States would invade Mexico if attacks on US interests did not cease. The protests raged on. Ambassador Wilson decided to visit General Porfirio Diaz, the dictator of Mexico, to insist that he put a stop to the so-called anti-American disturbances. But it was too late. By November of 1910, as we all know, um, the Magonistas and others had sowed the seeds of mass revolt in Mexico, and neither the United States nor Mexico would ever be the same. So those are some of the reasons why I think this story is important to contextualize within the historiography of the United States. Now let's talk. When I give this talk, I talk a little bit about the rebels, right? Of course, there's Labrador Rivera, a school teacher a quiet, reserved, learned man who his friends nicknamed him um, El Fakir for his ascetic ways. There's the extraordinary Juan Abelén Gutierrez de Mendoza who um, uh, was an autodidact from mountains of Durango and she was a vocal advocate for minors. I love her because every time she got arrested for protesting on behalf of minors, rather than sign her name, she would sign sedition and rebellion, sedition and rebellion. She would go on to join Emiliano Zapata's rebel forces and co-write um, Zapata's Manifesto of Plan de Ayala. And there's Antonio Villarreal, who was a literature professor who actually got into a duel, some say, over a literary dispute and did time um, in Mexico. 
These are just a few of the characters that I introduced the American public to um, at the center of this book. But of course, at the heart of it all is Ricardo Flores Magón. He was a journalist who looked more like a professor than a revolutionary. He was charismatic, but he was also vitriolic. And he edited this newspaper, Regeneración, um, which he dared to print the words nobody else would, right? He called D um, Diaz an autocrat and he was despotic. Um, he said, if you don't understand why, um, why Diaz is a, is a tyrant, is a dictator, that's because um, the public press is um, like an intoxicant, right? And he promised that uh, we're not currently revolutionaries, but we will be if the tyranny doesn't stop in Mexico. And for such claims and such words, Diaz had um, Flores Magón and his friends arrested multiple times and smashed their printing presses. And in 1903, issued a, a gag order, which prohibited any newspaper in Mexico from publishing their words. This you all know, but imagine American press or an American audience um, learning this story for the first time. So they crossed the border into Laredo, Texas in 1904, um, where they thought that they would find safe harbor, but quickly, um, days within, within arriving, they noticed that they're being followed by spies everywhere. And the Mexican consul in Laredo, Texas sends a coded telegram to Mexico City, warning Diaz, the Diaz regime, that Ricardo, Enrique, Camilo, Arriaga, Juan Sarabia, and others had arrived with the intent of um, inciting revolt um, across the borderlands. When they realized that they were being followed everywhere, the rebels knew that they had to move. They went to San Antonio and then to St. Louis. And after a series of rests, they began living as fugitives on the run. Still by 1906, their collective had relaunched Renacion, established the PLM and recruited an army. And in June 20, 1906, following a deadly labor strike in an American-owned mine in Cananea, Mexico, the PLM publicly vowed to launch an all-out revolt across Mexico within one year's time. They also issued a manifesto, right, the program that we're all familiar with, um, that was extraordinary for its time. It demanded a minimum wage, um, voting rights, an end to child labor, to eliminate debt servitude, and most important, to return land to the families displaced by all the major investors in Diaz's Mexico. The United States was extraordinarily alarmed by this plan and right on up to the United States President Theodore Roosevelt, um, who said it ordered the US Department of War to go to the utmost limit in proceeding against these so-called revolutionaries. And the US government had one year to shut down this revolt. Very quickly, the borderlands went on lockdown with soldiers, with marshals, with vigilantes on patrol, and they were ready to thwart any revolt that threatened US investments in Mexico. Still, the PLM army recruited among cotton pickers and miners and migrant workers living in the borderlands. They were ready to fight. And on September 26, 1906, Juan Jose Arredondo, a grandfather, led about 60 PLM fighters in a pre-dawn raid on the small town of Jimenez. By noon, they had locked up the mayor and other officials in jail and declared Jimenez free of Diaz's rule. But when the PLM army rode out of town to free um, the next community, someone opened the jail and the mayor called the nearest garrison. Soldiers tracked Arredondo and the PLM army across the borderlands, killing one in a shootout at a nearby hacienda. But most of those rebel fighters found their way back across the border into the United States where they thought they would be safe. But infuriated by the raid, Diaz sent more spies to infiltrate the PLM and ordered the Mexican consular officials to work with US agents to arrest, to extradite, deport, or even kidnap as many Magonistas as possible. The regime also hired the Thomas Furlong Secret Service um, Company to hunt down Ricardo Flores Magon. Now, Thomas Furlong was like one of those scrappy spy men from St. Louis. He imagined himself as America's Sherlock Holmes, and he hustled contracts from a larger company, the Pinkertons. He was always on the look for the next big job. And when the Mexican government, the consular officials showed up at his office and said, we need you to run down these revolutionaries, he jumped at the gig. Um, 
He made many contributions to the cross-border counterinsurgency that was coming together, but most important, he planted spies at US post offices across the country, or perhaps he paid off postal workers to be able to break in to the PLM's mail. What they would do is they would take letters out of envelopes, copy the letters down, put the letters back and send them on their way, hoping that the Magonistas, the PLM, the liberals would not know that their mail was being um, confiscated. But they did figure it out pretty quickly. Tomas Sarabia and others noticed that the PLM mail was arriving violada, right? And so they began to write in secret code. And here's an example of one of the secret code and passed their correspondence through numerous um, intermediaries. Still, um, the Magonistas were able to, to organize. I want to read to you a little bit about what this looks like when um, Thomas Furlong is following the Magonistas through the mail. And this particular incident from the book comes from page 160, um, 186. He's follow he begins by following Librado Rivera. So we knew his whereabouts continuously from the time he left St. Louis, boasted Furlong. By January 1907, Furlong had tracked Rivera to Texas, where he connected with the PLM gun runner, Antonio de Pio Arrojo, whom Mexican and US operatives identified using a string of pseudonyms and code names and PLM correspondence. In a letter Arrojo mailed at 3.30 a.m. from Waco, Texas, he wrote about how busy he had been collecting dulces y escobas for a raid on Matamoros just across the border from Brownsville, of course, dulces y escobas and PLM is um, like bullets and guns. He had already stashed 14 carbines, 1,600 cartridges, and 60 sticks of dynamite in the provisional barracks under the floorboards of an old ranch house outside of Del Rio. There was another stash in a cave about 10 miles away. The hour of vengeance is near, wrote Arrojo. The revolution will not wait another month. We go to victory or death. While waiting for Flores Magón to issue the signal to attack, the fighters look for work in and around Del Rio. But Flores Magón never sent the signal. He nixed the Matamoros raid, writing, quote, it's my opinion that we should not begin the movement. We need to first notify our comrades throughout the Republic of the instructions you already have so they can prepare themselves, they can be ready to fight. And when enough of us are ready, then we will begin the movements at once at all points. With the Matamoros raid on hold, Rivera began moving about with no clear pattern, mailing increasingly desperate dispatches from isolated locations. Under the pseudonym Lionel, he wrote from Denver, quote, I'm on the verge of being apprehended. I leave here tomorrow morning. Do not write anymore. I still do not know if I can escape. He then walked 33 miles through rain and snow, arriving in Colorado Springs with his feet, quote, full of sores. All he could afford to eat was a cup of coffee and a bit of bread. Esto es todo. That's it, he added. Alone and broke and worried that spies were following him everywhere, he begged his friends to send him funds to survive explaining that he could not look for work. If you have a peso or two, send me whatever you can. Pennies and dollars arrived from comrades across the United States and Mexico. Still in May of 1907, Rivera reported that he was in as desperate a situation as could be imagined, sin dinero, perseguido y sin trabajo. Although he was starving, Rivera, the quiet teacher from San Luis Potosí, refused to give up, remaining committed to the PLM and its cause. Now this is where it gets interesting. Rivera's wife felt differently. Back in St. Louis, Concepcion or Conchita Rivera had given birth to their third child, a baby girl named Teresita. Whenever possible, Rivera mailed her money, which she shared with the other PLM families in the city. Manuel Sarabia, Tomas Sarabia, and Ricardo Flores Magón also sent money to the families in St. Louis and the women split every dollar evenly. But it was never enough. As she struggled to feed her children, Conchita Rivera's letters to her husband grew increasingly tense. I make a dollar or two every week, but the work tires me and the baby won't let me be, she wrote. She wanted him to know how difficult her life was without his help. You should know that you left me in disgrace with my children. I am suffering without respite, she continued. And she was thinking about returning home to Mexico without him, she wrote. I want you to understand that I cannot live here. Let me leave. There it will be easier for me to raise my children. I am confident that they, the government officials, will not harm me. And she had already consulted Rivera's mother on the matter, and his mother agreed. Son, 
It is time for you to quit all this with your ideas of revolution for yourself, for your poor wife, for your innocent children, and your inconsolable mother. She wrote in a blistering letter from Mexico. We have already suffered so much and what have you gained? Not much, think about it. What if something happens to you, God forbid, if your enemies catch you? What will happen to your family, to your unfortunate children, inconsolable wife, and your mother who already suffers from your capriciousness? No son, think about it good and figure out how to escape the clutches of Fio Diaz. She wanted him to quit the campaign, but Rivera chose to stick with the PLM and kept moving, staying one step ahead of Furlong's men. So that's an example of the extraordinary intimacy that these letters, these stolen letters give us into the PLM and their activities. Um, in August of 1907, Furlong is able to use these letters to track Rivera along with Antonio Villarreal and Ricardo Flores Magón to a shack on the edge of downtown Los Angeles. And with several detectives from the LAPD, Furlong spies kick in the doors and brawl with the rebels for nearly an hour before knocking them unconscious and dragging them through the streets of LA to the local jail. The rebels spend the next three years incarcerated in the United States. And once they're incarcerated, US and Mexican agents expect them to die and to take their revolt with them to the grave. But the Magonistas rebellion only grew while Ricardo Flores Magón was incarcerated. So let's talk about how that happens. Um, in particular, it happens through the women, right? Women like Maria Bruce de Talavera, who smuggles correspondence back and forth from um, um, to Ricardo in jail. We all know the story about the slips of paper, the little messages um, sewn into the seams of their clothing. Um, and also because of a, a fighter named Praxidis Guerrero, um, who we all know is an unlikely Magonistas born into a wealthy family who becomes a migrant worker in the United States and joins with the PLM. And he becomes a powerful writer as well. And he says things um, that he's a little different of a writer than Ricardo Flores Magón. Ricardo would write these diatribes, right? These really long essays um, against Porfirio Diaz. And, and, and um, Praxidus would do these short, pithy, punchy, like Twitter ready um, phrases that people could use in oral tradition to move across the borderlands and he became wildly popular. Well, one of the things he helps to do is he helps to lead a series of attacks in June of 1908 that are profoundly lethal and dangerous for the Diaz regime that caused the world to wonder if um, Diaz's days are numbered. Within days of these raids happening in June of 1908, the United States government establishes a new police force. Teddy Roosevelt in particular um, helps to build something called the Bureau of Investigation within the US Department of Justice to enforce federal law. And this Bureau of Investigation, which we go on to become the FBI, which in the United States is the counterinsurgency super force um, that has been in particular directed against the black freedom movement and against radicals in the United States. Um, its first big case was tracking down the Magonistas and trying to suppress the outbreak of the 1910 Mexican Revolution. And dozens, if not hundreds, of Mexicanos are arrested across the borderlands um, after the establishment of the Bureau of Investigation. But it was too late. By 1910, the PLM had sowed the seeds of insurgency, and Mexico was en route to revolution. And so I'm going to close now. Um, in November of 1910, not long after the lynching of Antonio Rodriguez in Texas, um, incited riots across Mexico, the Mexican Revolution officially began. Ricardo Flores Magón and the Magonistas did not lead the major battles. The PLM's ill-provisioned army lacked the resources needed to lay siege to Diaz. Ricardo Flores Magón, released from prison in 1910, also lacked the will to shift from agitator to military general when the time came to fight. An anarchist, Ricardo believed that Mexico's aggrieved masses would spontaneously rise up and storm the dictator's palace once the PLM set the stage for revolt. And he was wrong about that. Francisco Madero, Pancho Villa, Emiliano Zapata, and others took the Mexican Revolution through its fighting phase. But it had been Ricardo Flores Magón and the PLM who had opened the road to revolution in Mexico. To do so, they had to thrash against the interlocking cores of empire, white supremacy, and capitalism in the United States at the dawn of the 20th century. And they had to force some of the most powerful people on earth 
the Guggenheims, the Rockefellers, the Roosevelts, to contend with the dreams and the demands of Mexico's dispossessed. The Maconistas made history and they did it on both sides of the border. And while there are legends in Mexico, it's important that folks in the United States also know their extraordinary tale. Not only does the Magonista story revolution from the borderlands make clear how Mexico and Mexicans are central to US history, but their motley band of rebel migrants, including intellectuals and cotton pickers and farm workers, miners, many of them undocumented migrants. They all played a major role in defining the world in which we live by defying the world in which they lived. So thank you. I'll hand it over to Israel. Muchas gracias, Kelly, eh, por esta presentación. Eh, voy a darle ahora la palabra al doctor Israel García Solares. Él es eh, doctorante en el Kellogg Institute for International Affairs de la Universidad de Notre Dame. Eh, el, en sus líneas de investigación eh, son historia del capitalismo y la tecnocracia. Entonces, Israel, eh, por favor. Hola, eh, gracias eh, Abraham, eh, gracias eh, a los organizadores, este, a Ali, a, a Daniel Kent, eh, gracias a la doctora eh, Leo Hernández eh, por eh, la oportunidad de comentar eh, su libro. Es difícil, digamos, con, con la presentación que hizo, eh, difícil seguir con algunos comentarios. Este, voy a hacer algunas observaciones este, más o menos rápidas, los voy a hacer, eh, preparo un texto en inglés y creo que... Eh, Voy a, voy a presentarlo eh, así. Eh, y bueno, eh, gracias por, 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 por este libro, es muy, muy interesante. Eh, bueno, eh, uh, now I'm going to switch to English. Um, so, uh, on September 21st, uh, 1906, uh, Crescencio Villarreal Márquez in the town in Del Rio uh, received a telegram that read, send $5 for the machine. Uh, he crossed the border to Mexico and alerted the rancher and former military member Juan José Arredondo in Jiménez, Chihuahua. They both knew the meaning of that telegram. La Junta, the leadership of the PLN, had instructed them to rebel in five days and follow a very vague set of instructions that included issue and circulate a proclamation profusely, five re uh, 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 give receipts of the amounts, uh, whatever take, being flexible with the authorities, confront the government forces with visible superiority, and go to another point in they constitute a respectable force. Um, exactly five days later, in the first hours of September 26th, around 60 fighters of the PLM had declared Jimenez free from the rule of Porfirio Diaz. Uh, it's uh, the episode that uh, uh, just uh, Dr. Lil just explained. The, the raid of Jimenez is one of the several small insurrections commanded by the PLM, uh, documented in Kelly Lil Hernandez's excellent work. Uh, the PLM, uh, it's hard to say that, has had more than its fair share of bio accounts in the last decades. Uh, Ricardo Flores Magón, the most famous of them, has at least a dozen of serious biographies on both sides of the border, uh, beginning with the uh, autobiography of Enrique, the work of Ethel Duffy Turner as well, um, and the studies on Magonismo are some of the classical reference in Borderlands modern social history. Uh, however, uh, Lira Hernandez accomplishes to give not only a new narrative to previously known facts and uh, a, new, um, uh, a new focus too, uh, but tell new stories based on archival research uh, uh, that rewrites the history of the anarchist organization. Um, it had always struck me uh, how the most influential biographies of leaders such as Zapata and Villa began and mostly ended well in their communities, their times and the organization of popular revolt. Uh, we all know um, uh, John Womack's, uh, the, the beginning of the book is this is about a town, even though the title is Zapata, right? Uh, and yet the stories of the PLM movement most of the time began and ended with Ricardo Flores Bajo. Uh, in a way, I always thought it appeared as if the story of the PLM was true to the spirit of anarchism uh, and uh, to begin and end with an individual uh, and true to Ricardo's isolating and sectarian charisma, which is a weird combination. Um, to be sure, Ricardo Flores Magón and his personal relations uh, are still a tremendous character in the new book of Khalil 
Hernandez, but they are far from the only ones, from Mexican-American ranchers to the young Porfirio Diaz himself, uh, and to the consuls on the border to the FBI, the range of characters in Bad Mexicans are more diverse and reveals the network that made possible the remarkable life of Ricardo Flores Magón that moved from Oaxaca to Mexico City to Canada and those in, uh, states in the US. Um, in the following lines, I I'll, would like to touch five points that I think the book opens for debate to the historiography in both sides of the border. Uh, as I said, Unlike other studies of the PLM, the history of bad Mexicans, the story of bad Mexicans does not start with Ricardo, but with the violent death of Antonio Rodriguez. Uh, the, Dr. Lil just read the passage. Um, and the book ends with the death of Ricardo Flores Magón, almost exactly 12 years later in the Livermore Penitentiary in Kansas. Uh, the choice is remarkable and talks to one of the central interventions of the book. Latino voices, this is a quote, uh, and stories have been shunted to the sidelines of US history. Stripped from the narrative, Latinos in the US are often cast as immigrants, outsiders, or newcomers to the American story. When in fact, Mexico, Mexicans, and Mexican Americans, as well as other Latino communities, have long been major plays in US history. To be sure, the Flores Magón and their closest allies were Mexican immigrants plotting a revolution not in the US but from the US into Mexico. Uh, so one of my questions would be, how can this emphasis on USAN history or history of the US uh, intervene in the way we think about the limits of Mexican history, uh, conversely, right? Um, Quien abusa del poder es que no tiene autoridad. This is one of my favorite rhymes of Muelas de Gallo, a rapper from Baja Sur. Uh, and this directly connects to uh, some of the other questions brought up by this book. It is now a common place in historiography to talk about the liminal nature of power and sovereignty in the borderlands. Uh, but I believe that the debates around the activities of the Pelemistas reveal something different, the mutual construction of exception spaces and moments on both sides of the border. Uh, following Muelas de Gallo or Carl Schmidt, if you prefer, uh, the question that arises is the nature of power coordination in these spaces and over these subjects. In other words, it is not only about who is the sovereign, but sovereign how. The coordination over these bad Mexicans, fugitives, and aliens was not based on the rule of law, but in breaking the legal order, breaking the consular uh, activities, um, intervening correspondence, illegally deporting subjects, etc. The question is, is sovereignty and the negotiation over the liminal status of the border not a material setting of limits and their ethnic compositions, but a shadow and shared power of exception? Um, connected to this is the history of the international construction of the policing order uh, shown in the book. Uh, the book traces the construction of policing mechanisms in the US and the role that the protection of US capital invested in Mexico or how um, the protection of US capital invested in Mexico shaped the collaboration on the repression of both governments. I think this is one of the main contributions of the book. It is based on a creative reading of two archival sources, the Archivo de la Embajada de Estados Unidos in Mexico and the NARA archives uh, in relationship with the birth of the FBI, basically. Um, but Mexicans show how the Mexican government established a generalized, a generalized surveillance system over its citizens living in the US through the consular service and articulated with local police informants and national elites to control and administer their political activities. The FBI on its side was born as a way to establish federal sovereignty over lands across the country, but it also started administering the political activities of these dangerous aliens in the country. And it's actually one of the stories of the uh, first, uh, I, I, it, uh, these first FBI agents are actually quite diverse because of the nature of the repression that they have to uh, do. Uh, so these two systems of policing, the book shows, articulated with local enforcement to precisely destroy or banish the political and civil rights of these rebel subjects and their possibility to participate in public debate. So I would like to uh, have Professor uh, Erna Leo Hernandez to talk a little bit more about the connection between this construction of illegality and this kind of like anti-rule of law through the institutionalization of this police agency, basically. Uh, how, and that still operates uh, today. Uh, part of what is refreshing about the narrative presented by bad Mexicans is the continuous, uh, uh, continuous effort to spark 
an armed insurrection in the country and show part of the leadership plans. In other words, it looks like we had all wrong, <clears throat> we had it all wrong, the history of the PLM and their underground activities. It is not without irony that the production of a newspaper forced the two governments to operate an illicit and clandestine organization of espionage over three countries. Uh, it, it, it looked uh, at the, the, this public and shadow uh, stories basically upside down. Um, um, and the PLM appears to be in any case, anything but secret. They sent invitations to the insurrection to Palacio Nacional soldiers, for God's sake. Uh, moreover, they also appear to have been more disciplined and hierarchical than a traditional anarchist uh, league or, or organizations. Uh, but uh, I cannot stop thinking that part of the strength of the network was providing weapons and discourse to local rebel, rebels across the border and less direct orders like the ones coded in their communications, like send $5 to the machine. Um, and the rates, for instance, of June 1908 uh, are an example of this. Uh, the book tells how Ricardo Flores Magón, through Ethel Toffee Turner and Elizabeth Trowbridge, gave detailed instructions for the raid in Viesca, Vacas y Palomas to Praxis Guerrero. Um, the different raids organized by members of the PLM were within hours from each other, but the local police had enough time to move to different places and extinguish the, rebel, the rebellious almost immediately. Uh, these events provoke great debate over the closed circle in uh, other accounts of this event. I mean, like uh, Claudio Lomdins mentions this uh, discussion with Enrique Flores Magón and so on. Uh, so, but um, I don't know how to play with this. Like, is it a, a well-planned? Insurrection, is it really Ricardo who is giving the orders? Are actually Ethel, Duffy, Turner, and Elizabeth Trowbridge giving the orders to, or is Praxis Guerrero taking the lead? And then everyone tries to take credit of it. Uh, so I, I, I would like just to, uh, to know a little bit more about the structure of the decisions of the anarchist organization, uh, or if it, if it only relied in, in Ricardo, basically, which is the, how usually we think about it. I'm almost, uh, then finally and related to this i would like to ask about the construction of the archive the production of presence and imagination in this work compared with other public and more significant movements such as the zapatistas and villistas the plm provides these scholars a pretty substantial documentation base for analysis on an individual level uh, they produce and receive letters every day they kept records of them pretty systematically despite being always suspicious and paranoid about the intervention of communications uh, for instance, in the deportation trial of Juan Jose Arredondo in San Antonio, Texas, the attorney showed to the court 62 letters between Crescencio Villarreal, Marquez, and Ricardo Flores Magón to prove that the Jimenez raid was not, a, no, was not criminal but revolutionary. Um, the intervention scheme between the Mexican consuls and the U.S. investigators provided other valuable information, a rebel archive, uh, 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 might be that, um, uh, but the political activities of the political activities of these radicals. And the survivors during and after the Mexican Revolution got to tell their version of the facts. In one moment of the narrative, Bad Mexican gets us into the dying bed of Margarita Magón as she chases out of their pool room to uh, Diaz emissaries saying she preferred to see her sons hang from a tree or a hanging post than for them to retract or repent. Then the author takes us back and reveals that most likely that scene was a fabrication by Enrique Flores and Magón. Um, and I, I, I bring this up because um, it, it is connected with the subject. Uh, the life of the revolutionaries are full of speculations. And those doubts grow even bigger when the historian tries to decipher their past from these little traces. Was Arredando a martyr in the PLM fight, kidnapped and executed in Mexico? Or was he a DES agent who delivered personal contacts to the whole network in exchange for a job? Did the Diaz administration know about the location of the Flores Magón before Furlong? Was the Mexicali raid an anarchist revolt or simply a, um, an insurrection of white bandits? Um, the historian tries to produce presence from their marks, the plots, plant hypotheses, and uh, chismes break their limits and boundaries. I would like to know how you connect these stories with current efforts in construction narratives of the ones that by nature the archive, the archive forgets. I'm thinking really the words of Avery Gordon in sociology, Diana Taylor in performance, and Marisa Fuentes in, in history. Uh, in some of these efforts, the building of presence requires the researcher's imagination of the experienced reality of the subjects of history. As revolutionaries, part of their experience is constantly imagining other realities. These are non-consequential, 
uh, and they make leaps in the means and ends. Uh, for instance, the attack on this small branch will begin the abolition of property. Uh, how do we, how can we access or how uh, is your approach in accessing that, this archive of political imagination of these bad Mexicans? Especially because the imagination was basically the main um, weapon that the Pelemistas had. They didn't have big, uh, uh, big uh, infrastructure to actually have a big army, but they were trying to connect their imagination with the, uh, the needs of the people. So. Uh, is there a space to share that space of imagination in their heads with this library of what never happened uh, and, uh, you know, try to share those memories of this uh, future's past? Uh, that, that's, that's my question. Thank you very much for the, for the book. It's, it was very, very interesting. Uh, and I look forward to hear a little bit more about it. Gracias, Israel. Antes de regresar la palabra a Kelly, probablemente veo que Eh, quisieras eh, contestar algunas de las eh, preguntas que hizo Israel. Eh, eh, quiero retomar, bueno, se me olvidó mencionar, eh, el libro no puede ser más actual, estamos en el año de, el gobierno federal en México adoptó este como el año de, eh, 2022 como el año de Ricardo Flores Magón y el texto de Eh, el precursor de la Revolución eh, Mexicana. Eh, y también quiero aprovechar mi calidad de moderador para regresar a un punto que mencionaste al principio, Kelly, sobre eh, la escritura o cómo eh, quizá alguno de los retos, eh, me imagino, eh, fue presentar esta narrativa para audiencias, eh, no solamente dos tradiciones historiográficas, Eh, nacionales eh, la, en Estados Unidos y México por mencionar así las dos quizá las dos más evidentes pero cómo encontrar eh, este balance me parece que es un, una, una un acierto del libro que se puede leer eh, un balance eh, eh, hay un buen balance entre eh, este Porfirio Díaz joven entender de dónde viene y cómo se eh, cómo va a la par Eh, como es el crecimiento político de Porfirio Díaz, pero también al, al mismo tiempo la relevancia de presentar el despliegue de la, las oficinas postales en Estados Unidos, como parte de una historia que eh, da una nueva interpretación a, al, al PLM. Eh, bueno, esa era un poco mi pregunta, cómo, cómo con, con genial, cómo... Eh, hacer un balance para la audiencia que estás eh, escribiendo. Por favor, Kelly. Okay. Thank you. Those comments and questions are fantastic um, and really helping me to think through the next life of this book. So in some ways, I think I can, I would like to approach, Abraham, your question along with Israel's first question about, or first statement, you know, it's funny, Israel, that you um, noticed that the book opens with a lynching in Mexico and closes with the death of Ricardo Flores Magón. Because in my mind, the book opens with a lynching in Mexico and closes with a plan de San Diego y la matanza, um, which is like another act of, well, profound act, uh, incident of racial violence in the United States. And I wanted to bookend this book um, by centering and anchoring this history of rebellion within the story of white supremacy in the United States. And so Abraham, that goes to your question about this balance between the US and Mexican historiographies. Um, for the audience that I'm speaking to, uh, I really want them to see this story as part of the US canon, right? To be able to do that, you have to understand 19th century Mexico, right? You have to understand the life and times of Porfirio Diaz in particular. So it's the two chapters I spend with his personal biography is a way of entering into um, 19th century Mexico and the, the political chaos, right? In particular, that I wanted, I want US readers to understand why it is in some ways that um, autocrat like Diaz could, could survive so long in power. Um, and it's not because people had um, agreed to his rule. 
but it was coming out of the 19th century, the exhaustion, right, of, of that experience, um, the serial invasions and the violence and his own tactical brilliance, frankly, as a politician that could make that possible. So it is walking a line between two histories and historiographies to be able to understand um, where the PLM comes from. But in particular, I want people to understand their impact within that context of US history and US history of race in particular. Um, so I think that gets at the two. I, I can do, I, I can address some of these other questions, but did you want, are there other questions we want to get on the table before I move forward? No, eh, si quieres adelante. Sí. Okay. Um, I want to talk about policing first, Israel. That's a really great question. And I'm actually trained as a police historian more than anything else. My dissertation advisor was wonderful, um, Eric Munkinen. And it was important to me um, as someone who I, I currently work in the movement and mass incarceration here in the United States. And my last book, City of Inmates, was about that story and, and trying to do a couple of things. Um, but one, to diversify and strengthen the front lines by finding the multiple histories of mass incarceration and its impact upon what we hear called BIPOC or Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, communities. And so trying to create a really expansive understanding of policing and mass incarceration. And I think this book, like literally, and also politically is an extension of that in many ways. Um, in the movement, there is, um, of course, deep and troubling counterinsurgency that's going on today targeting Black Lives Matter and others. And much of that you know, can be tracked back to organizations such as the, the FBI. And so it was important to me to lift up and highlight how there's a Mexican history that's part of the origin story of the FBI and to amplify how the world's first social revolution of the 20th century in Mexico um, is linked to the, the formation of the FBI in the early 20th century. So for me, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you picked up on that theme about the importance of policing and Mexican immigrant communities and counterinsurgency and that, that, that came through clearly, but you're, you're spot on. Um, your question about the connection of illegality and this new policing agency, well, of course, I mean, that's what counterinsurgency is, is defining these sets of activities as, um, criminal or illegal. Um, today, the Black Lives Matter movement is also being um, discussed and framed in those ways. Um, so that's part and parcel to all of this. But of course, at the same time, you have happening um, the creation of a new sphere of illegality through the immigration regime. That's just happening in the early 20th century in the United States around the criminalization of border crossing, um, which would happen in the 20s, but around the, the growth of deportation. And all of those tools are being leveraged against the, the Magonistas. And so the first mass deportation of Mexicans from the United States is a group of Magonistas who get deported from Southern Arizona. And so um, the story of political suppression, immigration control, and white supremacy are always so interlocked. And that's part of what I'm trying to, to pull together here. Um, your question about the structure of the PLM as an anarchist organization, which is almost like an anarchist organization, like what is that, <laughs> right? Um, now, of course, the PLM is having its own internal debates about whether or not it's going to be anarchist, right? And so that becomes clear by 1911 with at least the Los Angeles faction declaring their anarchy. Um, You know, as far as I can read it, um, one, it's a social movement that's moving quickly, um, that's being hunted. And so part of the structural issues, I think, are just the conditions that they're living and working under. The other part, I think, is ideal, idealistic from Ricardo Flores Magón of not wanting to have centralized control over um, the rebellion. And so that's why these, these guidelines for revolt um, look the way that they do. Um, I just also think he was not that person. He was not that kind of general. He was never going to be um, the person who could organize that kind of armed revolt. He was the writer, he was the intellectual, he was an inspiration, um, but was he someone who coordinated 
uh, a campaign like that, I doubt that that was him. I suspect that um, Praxidus and many others played really significant roles in the 1908 raids, as you have indicated. Um, and the question about the archive. You know, there's so much that we gain from the stolen letters, right? But there's also been so much that we've lost along the way. Deborah Weber um, has written about a set of correspondence that was burned by the descendants of, of one of the, the PLM members. Um, there's the records that the PLM burned themselves while they were living on the run or destroyed in other ways as they were living on the run. Um, there is, there are the issues around Ricardo, his own political transformation from socialism to anarchy and his efforts and the efforts of others to suppress that transformation. So it's hard for us to identify exactly when he makes that change. But when you talk about the political imagination, um, not all that's getting written down. And in some ways that's to their benefit, of course, because in 1903, anarchists can be deported, uh, immigrant anarchists can be deported from the United States. So um, my next goal with this story is to not approach it as a historian who is grounded in the archive because of the limitations of the archive and to begin some creative work um, with some storytellers here in Los Angeles to use our own imaginations about what was possible. And in particular, I'm interested in thinking through the women, right? Who Claudio Lomnitz and others have talked about why we have so few written records um, from the women who were involved in the movement. The, the traditional gender issues of the turn of the 20th century, but also literacy issues. Um, I wanna think about Juana. I wanna think about Maria. I wanna think about all of these women who were involved in the PLM revolt and take the archival nuggets that we have to be able to think through what else they might have been doing um, at that time to hold and move this revolution forward that becomes increasingly important during the time that Ricardo Flores Magón is in prison for three years in the United States. It's my guess that the women played a significant role, um, but we don't have the archive for it. We probably never will as we have to use our imaginations to try to tell their story a little bit better than we've been able to do to date. Um, so while acknowledging everything that the archive forgets, I think that we have enough nuggets to try to reconstruct what was possible back then. And I'm you know, dedicated to doing that work. I think, did I get them all? Yeah. So thank you so much for your comments. I really appreciate it, Israel. Muchas gracias, Kelly. Israel, de nuevo, gracias. Eh, Magali, me parece que tienes un... Sí, 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 rápido, breve, porque ya estamos sobre el tiempo eh, y yo andaba corriendo y no me conecté como debía. Eh, pues nada, agradecer primero a, a Kelly eh, y a Israel por aceptar esta invitación de formar parte de este coloquio que creo que ayer con la conferencia de Ariel Rodríguez Curi eh, quedó más que claro que es necesario hacer este tipo de reflexiones y encuentros, ¿no? Y lo, a mí lo creo que lo que quiero comentar es la importancia de tener a Kelly acá sobre todo porque necesitamos este tipo de diálogo entre las dos historiografías, ¿no? Entre historiadoras e historiadores de ambos lados, ¿no? Y que además tenemos como foco de análisis quizá la frontera, ¿no? Como un espacio, eh, pues, de convergencia, ¿no? Revolucionario, en este caso, en, en, en el tema del Partido Liberal Mexicano. Eh, y además porque esta presentación del libro no solo conecta con, pues, con las participaciones o ponencias de la mesa del día de ayer, que están como muy ligadas a, a, a los tiempos, los actores, las actoras, etcétera, etcétera, sino que justamente es como un, la apertura como de un camino a lo que justamente mencionaba Ariel, ¿no? La necesidad de voltear a ver, ¿no? A la historiografía de Estados Unidos desde acá, pero yo creo que también la necesidad que desde allá se vea la historiografía mexicana, ¿no? ¿Qué, ¿Qué están haciendo los historiadores y las historiadoras mexicanas respecto a la frontera? Pero también refre, respecto, a la, respecto a la historia de Estados Unidos, que creo que es algo que se está comenzando a hacer. Bueno, aquí tenemos a Israel, tuvimos a David, que también está trabajando temas que conectan directamente con la historia de Estados Unidos y que creo que es muy, muy importante. Y respecto 
A la figura de Ricardo Flores Magón, eh, con esto concluyo, eh, conecto con, con lo que ya mencionó Abraham, ¿no? es un año muy particular en México respecto a los homenajes y todo lo que se va a venir en septiembre y en noviembre respecto a Flores Magón, pero también, y me encanta esto que decías Kelly, que también hay una idealización ¿no? de la figura de, de Ricardo Flores Magón, una construcción desde la memoria y desde la historia de la figura de Ricardo Flores Magón, pero no solo en México, sino también en Estados Estados Unidos, o sea, Ricardo Flores Magón es una figura del movimiento chicano, lo vemos en murales, en poemas, eh, en fin, o sea, está presente y eso es lo más interesante, ¿no? Es una figura que desde esta idea del anarquismo o desde el internacionalismo, pues cumple, ¿no? <ríe> o sea, está presente en dos espacios que aparentemente se dividen, ¿no? Por una frontera poli pol política, hermética, en fin, viéndolo desde la actualidad, pero en realidad, pues justamente la historia nos lleva a, a pensar a estos personajes que, que, digamos, que trascienden, ¿no? Estas, estas divisiones. Y, y pues nada, agra agradecer y, 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 y qué maravilloso que, que vayas a seguir explorando estos temas. Este, creo que hay mucho que explorar sobre el periodo, no solo lo que tiene que ver con el Partido Liberal Mexicano y sus integrantes más conocidos, ¿no? Sino la base, que era lo que platicábamos con David eh, el día de ayer. Y entonces, pues, muchísimas gracias por, por estar acá, Kelly. Bien. Eh, bueno, eh, veo que estamos sobre el tiempo. No quiero dejar de preguntarte, Kelly, si nos puedes hablar eh, de tus proyectos, hacia dónde piensas seguir eh, esta línea de investigación, eh, cuáles son tus planes próximos o no tan próximos? That's a good question. <laughs> um, is that for you, me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, like I said, we're doing some work on how to expand the story. Um, this is part of a, this book is part of a larger project around Latinx storytelling in the United States. And so it's strategically written for a broad audience. And we're trying to really crack open those doors, um, not just for um, Chicano history, but for more Latinx histories. So I'm, I'm working pretty hard on that. And I continue to do my work. Um, I have a, a big data project called Million Dollar Hoods where we map the cost of incarceration here in Los Angeles. And we're doing a, a major project on archiving the age of mass incarceration. Um, so we're doing oral histories, we're collecting up. We sued the LAPD and we won the Los Angeles Police Department. We won their historical records. Um, so we're archiving those historical records. I see your eyes, Israel, right? <laughs> um, So I, you know, I always say I work on sort of historical work in the early morning hours and I work on social movement work in the afternoons and I'm very blessed to be able to do, to do all of that. Genial. Bueno, eh, pues eh, a mí no me queda más que agradecerlos, agradecerles por estar aquí. Eh, Kelly, una vez más, muchas gracias. Eh, por este libro, lo recomendamos muchísimo, Israel, gracias por tu intervención eh, y los invitamos a las, a, la mesa, a las mesas que tenemos programadas para la tarde que continúan, tenemos dos sesiones, la primera empieza a las 4 de la tarde eh, en la mesa que se llama Solidar Solidaridad Internacional Exilio y Redes en el periodo de entreguerras eh, y a las 5.30 tenemos la mesa, trayectorias desde las guerrillas y los movimientos revolucionarios de la segunda mitad del siglo XX. Eh, bueno, sin otro, sin otro comentario más, lo dejamos hasta aquí. Que pasen buena tarde. Gracias. Gracias, Kelly. Gracias.